Science, Technology, and Religion group. I want to welcome you. Uh, this is the Cosmic Quest, Cosmic Contact, Astrobiology, Astrotheology, and Astroethics session. Um, basically, what we're going to do this is that uh, we have six presenters today. We're going to do the first three. Uh, they're going to offer a short introduction about who they are and what they do. And then we're going to take about a 15 minute pause for questions and a uh, little discussion. And we'll have a short break for stretching getting a drink, so, something like that. Then we'll come back to the last three and we'll finish uh, with discussion there. So the, the first three we're going to start with are Margaret Grace, Albert Harrison, and Chris Cruz. And as I tell let them say a little bit about who they are. How's everybody doing today? Okay. How's everybody doing today? Great. 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 So if this will allow me to uh, roam around, I'm going to do that since I'm not much for standing behind the podium. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yes. Okay. You might be able to carry on the <laughs> microphone, Chris. Try it. See if that makes a difference. So uh, first, I think it's important to sort of position myself. So my training is as a political theorist. I'm currently a doctoral student with the New School in New York City. And basically what I'm going to be looking at today is part of a much bigger project looking at the intersection of religious worldviews, environmental politics, and science education. Today I'm specifically looking at this question of astrobiology and young earth creationism. So for those who are not familiar, young earth creationism is sort of a subset within not just Protestantism, but it's certainly the, sort of the root of Protestantism. So it starts from the belief that the Bible is the literal and error word of God. Uh, reading of Genesis says that the world was created in six literal 24-hour normal days, Therefore, the universe, the earth, and everything in it is about six to 10,000 years old. Noah's flood, Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve, all of these are actual real things that did happen and in many ways explain the reason we're seeing sin, death, decay, and everything in the world today. So for my talk today, we need to understand that that worldview of young earth creationism informs all that we're going to be looking at today. So... Why does this matter? So as a political theorist, one of the things we always ask is, why are these things relevant? Well, there's a couple different reasons. You know, a majority of the United States identifies as Christian, about 78%, and about one-third of the world, based on surveys, identifies um, as Christian. So just in terms of the sheer uh, population of the public, the majority being um, Christian in the United States, and the evangelical churches being the largest block specifically within the U.S. amongst Christians. And I'll look at a little more of that data in a minute. And, and most of the survey polls in the last 30 years, questions about age of the earth, evolution, um, almost a majority, 40 to 50 percent of the U.S. public, generally identifies with at least some creationist views, either young or older. So we see this in battles over curriculum in the schools. In fact, Texas had a hearing on Friday about what was going to be in the curriculum there with the school board. Uh, and then since the 2000s, we've seen a rise in um, sort of young earth apologetics, particularly through parachurch organizations, groups like uh, Answers in Genesis, Institution of Creation Research, Creation Research Society, um, and other various groups. And we've also seen a resurgence um, in what people will call sort of new right Christian politics, Tea Party politics, um, and many uh, people getting elected from local levels to national levels um, that hold at least some what uh, secular part of the society would call conservative evangelical views. And you can think about the rise of climate change denial or science skepticism as sort of two examples of that. So uh, a few polls to give us a sense of what we know in terms of public research and scholarship. Um, these are from 2005, the NBC News poll asked about beliefs in the origins of humans, and a majority, 44%, said they believe in a literal six-day creation as described in Genesis 1. And similarly, a Pew Research poll from 2005 on the question of divine creation or evolution, about 42% said they believe that God created humans. So if we look at the Pew uh, 2008 Religious Landscape Survey, is a pretty good way to kind of position ourselves in some of the social science research. Um, so if we think about 78% of the United States identifies as Christian, within that about 34% being affiliated with evangelical churches and about another 30% Catholic churches, and then 23 with mainline. So that's kind of our context for a lot of these discussions. So if we look at the census data, this is from earlier this month in terms of the population. There's about 317 million Americans, 78% of that. will give us about 247 million Americans who are operating within uh, Christian context, and then about 84 million who specifically would be identified as evangelical. 
And then it's really this evangelical base where a lot of the young earth creationism comes out of. Certainly not only. You'll have Catholic, Mormon, and many other groups that will identify with some of these young earth ideas. But in terms of popular discourse, this is kind of the main area. So two key things to keep in mind when we're talking about this. About 80% of the US public operates within a theological framework or worldview, whether it's about origins, evolution, or other things. And based on the survey data, if we're to believe the extrapolation from you know, a certain number of sample to the whole population, then about half of the American public believes in a young Earth creation view. So six to 10,000 years, humans in their present form created in those first six days. So in the 2012 Gallup survey poll, they found that basically 46% of the public identified with younger creationism. If we put this on a sort of bigger historical line, looking at the uh, Gallup poll data starting in 1982, this is young earth creationism here. It's been pretty steady at about 44%. Interestingly, in about 2010, we saw a divergence. So we actually see a rise in support for young earth creationism, a drop in support for old earth creationism, and then kind of a slow, very minor growth in support for naturalistic evolution. So this is kind of the religious popular landscape in some ways that we need to be thinking about when we're looking at these questions. So part of my bigger research project is really looking at the emergence of uh, creation science or scientific creationism, what that means, how it's being um, sort of expanded, understood, taught, and used for apologetics. And specifically in this case uh, with astrobiology, there's three main areas where I'd like to suggest that there's some important connection between the two. So one has to do with science education, science literacy. Second one has to do with government funding, grant research for astrobiology. The third has to do with um, increasing polarization both within religious communities and between kind of religious and secular communities. So these are some of the key things if uh, I've been finding at the last year of going through a lot of the young earth creation literature. First three here are specifically about astrobiology. So the first thing is, well, we never found any life in space, so astrobiology is basically a science without an object. Another one is it's a waste of public money. If there really are no aliens in the world, which the Bible tells us there aren't any, then why are we wasting public money looking for something that doesn't exist? Um, and the idea that to believe in astrobiology, we have to believe in cosmic evolution. That's a basic principle. And from a biblical, uh, younger creation's perspective, that's not a starting point they're willing to start from. Uh, so these are kind of the specific critiques of astrobiology on the top. These others are more general critiques of astronomy and much of the space sciences. So they would say, well, if the universe is 6,000 years old, obviously we can't be living in a you know, 13.7 billion year old universe plus or minus. Uh, there's little or no evidence for the Big Bang. Um, why don't we see equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the universe, as we would expect? Uh, dark matter, dark energy, what are these things? We can't seem to see them, we can't seem to measure them, but yet they are critical to much of the sort of theories that make up the larger theory um, of the Big Bang. Uh, stellar evolution, so if we come from stardust, where did the stardust come from? It had to have started from somewhere, where did that first star come from? but then led to all the later stars. Um, this question of distant starlight. So if we do really live in a universe that's billions of light years across, which means it's billions of years old, and the universe is only 6,000 years old, how do creation scientists reconcile an old universe with a young creation? And this is where the idea of distant starlight has come in. And it's a very technical discussion we can get into later if people are interested, but it involves creating essentially a new physics to help explain how time dilation and uh, other five-dimensional physics would work. And finally, comets are basically ice balls floating through space. So as they go by suns, they're melting. So there's no way we can have comets that are billions of years old because they would have melted as they passed around stars. So these are some of the examples of the critiques we see coming from the young Earth creation community, and specifically the creation astronomy community. The other half of this is looking at the question of extraterrestrial life, ET aliens. So Jesus, as we know, died once for all. He's not going to die on Mars and Jupiter and at least 581D. <laughs> it's just not possible. And so therefore, from a purely sort of redemption, uh, salvific discussion, aliens didn't come from Adam. Jesus died to redeem the human bloodline from Adam. Therefore, even on the exception that there were aliens, there's no way that they're ever going to make it into heaven because their sins will never be forgiven. 
they're still part of the groaning of creation, but they're not part of the bloodline of Adam, so tough luck if you're an alien and you like to go to human heaven. Uh, there's nothing in the scriptures that mentions aliens, although some people would argue that maybe there's some interesting potential alien-like things in some of the books. But uh, on a clear reading, there's certainly nothing about in the book of aliens. Now, here's where you get an interesting twist. Interdimensional beings. So there is a strain within both young and old Earth creationism, Gary Bates being um, one advocate, who says that actually maybe there are aliens, but they're not space aliens. They're actually interdimensional beings, demons, who essentially have come across from the spirit realm to try to tempt people into sin and to do Satan's work. And so they don't actually live in outer space, but maybe we think of them as aliens. And he gives an interesting example of some of the research that's been done within the Christian community looking at abduction stories. There's a consistent narrative of people who said as they felt that they were being abducted, they cried out Jesus' name and immediately whatever phenomenon was stopped. And that's been documented repeatedly within some of the uh, alien UFOlogy Christian circles. And Gary Bates points to that as one more example that really what we're talking about is aliens as the doorway to the occult in the New Age, and hence demons or demonic beings are operating under the guise of this scientific, uh, science-fictionized culture that they see as astrobiology and astronomy partly playing into with arguments about secular evolution and no need for God in the universe. So this is sort of a second set of the ideas we see. So over the last year or two, I've been slowly collecting a pretty extensive body of literature from uh, creationist young and old. This is just kind of a smattering of some of the books specifically about creation science. There's one or two, like Ken Ham's new six day book or R.C. Sproul's Depending on Faith, isn't specifically creation science. But most of these are specifically about creation science, and many of these, as you can see, astronomy, Jason Lyles, uh, Taking Back Astronomy, Big Bang, and Henry Morris's original scientific creationism. So there's a growing body of literature that goes back to the 60s, but it's really exploded um, in the last 10 or 15 years. And similarly, these are all videos and DVDs that have been produced through these various parachurch organizations and ministries. And a couple of these on the bottom have to do with Genesis debates, but most of these are all about astronomy or origin science. Uh, and so these are being used in homeschool programs, in classrooms that are doing biblical apologetics, in uh, evangelical universities, and through a lot of kind of public events. So if you go to any of the creationist or many evangelical conferences, you're likely to see some of these materials being produced there and sold there. So one of the things I wanted to ask is if creationism seems to be having a significant influence in public society, if we believe the Pew and Gallup and other polls, how do we actually test for that besides survey data that may or may not be accurate? So one way to do that is in 2009, Cosmos Magazine, which is based in Australia, did a project known as Hello from Earth. The idea was there's an exoplanet about 20 light years away called Gliese 581b. And it's in a zone that we believe might be habitable for life. And so what they ask is the public to send them brief messages. So think 250 characters or something like a Twitter tweet. And they collected all those in the summer of 2009, compressed them, digitized them, and then shot them off into space to Gliese 581D. And so what I did was I went through and looked at the data that was provided. So this is the Gliese 581 system. Gliese 581 is a red dwarf star. This is kind of a comparison. This is our sun and some of our planets. This is Gliese 581 and some of the planets. So this is Gliese 581d. This blue line is what uh, would be considered the habitable zone, where we think water and life might be able to exist. So you see Earth here in the habitable zone in relation to the planet. So there was about 40,000 messages that the public submitted over this period of about a month in August of 2009 to Cosmos Magazine. And it tied into two things. One was the Science Week that was going on, uh, sorry, National Astronomy Week in Australia, and that was also the International Year of Astronomy at the UN. So they were kind of using all of this public interest in astronomy to generate content. 40,000 messages were sent in by the public from all over the world. About 29,000 of those were actual usable messages once they cut out the spam and the advertisements and the other content. And then that was sent into space, and about 2029 or so, that these messages will reach Gliese 581D. 
So what I did is I went through and looked at that 29,000 data set. I got in contact with uh, Cosmos Magazine. They sent me the entire data set as an Excel file. And I went through and did filters and keywords to try to bring together a body of religious messages from all of these. And about 647 of these 29,000 messages have some actual religious content. And these are kind of the categories or subcategories that I uh, coded them into. Explicit here at the top being an explicitly religious message, especially Christian, but not only Christian. And so the explicit religious messages were the most common. The God question was the most uh, second most common. So people asking aliens, do you have gods? Do you believe in God? Are you God? Questions like that. Uh, incidental being something like a message that ended with God bless you. Uh, alien focus, people wondering about aliens. Uh, many atheistic messages. Um, a number actually from Islam, uh, Hinduism, and Buddhism, a number of Bible quotes. Only three actual creationist messages, and they were all making fun of creationists, telling aliens, please don't believe them, that's not what we really think. So this is an example of some of the actual text messages. So you see, if your planet really exists, has the creator revealed himself to you, he has to us here on earth, his name is Jesus Christ. God exists, Jesus Christ is our Lord. Jesus is the Lord of the universe, also died and rose for you. Hello, my friend, do you believe in God? I just want to tell you, Jesus, God's Son loves you and died for your sin. May God bless you and your planet. This is just a sample of these hundreds of messages that were sent in the States. So I went a little bit deeper and said, okay, within these explicitly religious messages, how is the Bible actually being used? So John 3.16 is the key message we're sending to outer space, followed uh, closely after by Genesis 1.1. Uh, Philippians, Luke, John, Acts, and Psalms. So this is the religious uh, Christian message that is currently on its way to Galice 581D. So what does all this mean? I am, I'm simplifying a lot here because this is about a 60-page paper that I tried to condense into a 15-minute presentation. So from a creation astronomy and astrobiology perspective, there's three real key areas. If more people believe in a young earth creation view, then there's going to be a harder job for astrobiologists to make the case for a naturalistic science project. If less people believe in aliens or extraterrestrial life, they may be less likely to want to support funding through NASA or other places for these searches. And if you're told as a Christian that you have to believe this and only this to be a true Christian and to follow the Bible, then it becomes harder if you're interested in being a Christian who may also believe in, say, the Big Bang or the possibility of life in space to reconcile those views, as well as people outside who don't accept a creationist view at all. Uh, the question of young earth creationism and extraterrestrials, basically the Bible says it's not possible. Aliens don't come from Adam, Jesus didn't die for them, and therefore they can't be saved. And actually, maybe if there are aliens, they're interdimensional demonic beings, so you really wouldn't want to make contact with them anyway. And the last part, these are kind of normative or prescriptive suggestions to the astrobiology community as someone looking from the outside. There really needs to be a thought about developing what I'm calling tentatively an astrobiology apologetics. If the astrobiology community is serious about engaging with communities of faith, regardless of whether they're Christian or not, there needs to be a way to have a discussion about these questions about naturalism, about origins, about faith, in a way that respects different traditions, but also tries to create a way to have a dialogue about where do we draw the line between when we'll agree to disagree. Because in some cases, that's going to have to be the argument for creationists and hardcore scientists. There will never be a perfect uh, matching of views. And particularly thinking about the future, uh, based on what I'm seeing, I would suggest that astrobiologists shouldn't just ignore creationists, particularly young earth creationists, as if they don't matter, because they do actually matter. In fact, trying to engage with them might be a more proactive strategy. It's certainly going to be a complicated strategy, but it might be worth uh, exploring. So I leave you with the sci-fi religious hybrid, Jesus in space. Thank you.